From amazing title wins to intense rivalries, from a host of some of the best drivers to ever sit behind the wheel to the much-discussed Spygate, McLaren's history is full of incredible ups and downs. A lot of downs. Like the time both of their drivers missed out on the driver's title by a single point. But now, now things have changed. Now they have hope in the shape of Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri. Now they might just be back. This is the story of how the team from Woking became the force they are today. It all started in 1958, when Bruce McLaren embarked on an adventure to the United Kingdom with the Driver to Europe program. This initiative aimed to bring talented drivers from the Southern Hemisphere to compete with the best in the world. Bruce's mentor in those early days was none other than the famous Jack Brabham, a former Formula One world champion. Under Brabham's guidance, Bruce got his foot in the door at Cooper Cars. Cooper Cars had a revolutionary idea. They were working on creating compact and lightweight Grand Prix cars with an engine positioned behind the driver. This concept was quite different from the norm at the time. One of the defining moments in Bruce's career came in 1959, when at just 22 years and 80 days old, he won the United States Grand Prix for the Cooper F1 team, a victory that made him the youngest Grand Prix winner of his time. But Bruce was no ordinary driver. His fascination with cars began early, at the age of 14. He even participated in a local hill climb event driving an Austin 7 Ulster. Despite his very obvious talent as a racer, though, Bruce's true passion lay in innovating and developing race cars. Fueled by this passion, he decided to start his own racing team in 1963. Enter the Bruce McLaren Motor Racing Team. This was an outfit that aimed to push the boundaries and compete at the highest level of motorsport. They initially focused on developing and racing a Cooper with a rear-mounted Oldsmobile engine, which helped initiate the big banger sports car era. Yeah, don't ask me why it was called that. Bruce and his team had a lot of success in other forms of motorsport before he finally turned his eyes towards F1. But for the sake of your attention span, let's keep it strictly about Formula One for now. Amidst their success in a certain Can-Am series, McLaren also ventured into Formula One as a constructor. In 1965, Bruce made the decision to leave Cooper and build his own Formula One car. The result was the M2B which made its debut at the 1966 Monaco Grand Prix. Bruce believed in pushing the boundaries of engineering in racing. To achieve this, he recruited Robin Hurd, an expert from the aerospace industry, known for working with materials like malite. So you know this guy was really serious about building the best car possible. Tragically, Bruce McLaren's life was cut short in 1970, during a testing accident at Goodwood. His death was a huge blow, but his legacy and team continued to thrive under the guidance of Teddy Mayer and with the unwavering support of Denny Hume. In 1974, racing legend Emerson Fittipaldi made a groundbreaking move, leaving Lotus to join the Papaya outfit. Fittipaldi's in-depth knowledge of the Lotus 72 became the secret weapon as McLaren set out to create their masterpiece, the M23, and the results were astonishing. In no time, McLaren clinched their first ever Drivers' and Constructors' World Championships. The M23 boasted four incredible wins that season. But McLaren wasn't about to rest on its laurels. The 1975 season brought even more jaw-dropping developments to the M23. A daring six-speed gearbox, an absolute novelty at the time, gave Fittipaldi the edge he needed to secure a solid second place in the Drivers' Championship, trailing only the mighty Nicky Lauda with his Ferrari's 312T chassis. McLaren's dedication to innovation was evident in the M23's design experiments. They pushed the boundaries, trying various bodywork styles, including aerodynamic kickups in front of the rear wheels and revolutionary side-mounted skirts. These cutting-edge additions paved the way for groundbreaking technology in Formula One, laying the foundation for the iconic ground-effect technology we see in modern racing. In 1976, Fittipaldi decided to venture into his own team, and the charming and tenacious James Hunt took his seat. The M23 underwent further evolutions, embracing new regulations that outlawed tool airboxes over the engines. The team's creative minds ingenuously positioned mid-mounted air scoops on either side of the roll bar, ensuring the car remained at peak performance. As the season unfolded, Hunt showcased his prowess, conquering six exhilarating victories and ultimately claiming the prestigious World Championship title. 
When the 80s rolled in, McLaren hit a bit of a rough patch. Enter Ron Dennis and his Project 4 racing team to the rescue. Dennis brought a fresh wave of ambition and he reunited with designer John Barnard, and McLaren shocked the racing world with their MP4 One car, a carbon fiber chassis. Safety and rigidity went to a whole new level in Formula One. The MP4 One cars had their moments, but things got serious when the Porsche designed Tag Turbo engine joined the party. Hello, brother. Nicky Lauda and John Watson were flying high, winning races left and right. In 1984, Lauda bagged his third title while McLaren celebrated their second Constructors' Championship, securing an impressive 12 wins out of 16 races. Yeah. These guys were Red Bull before they were cool. Then came along a certain Frenchman and Brazilian to race for McLaren. And oh boy, was this the beginning of the end for the rest of the grid. We're gonna win so much, you may even get tired of winning. With Honda's engines, the legendary Ayrton Senna and the brilliant Alain Prost made a fearsome team. They ruled the roost and cracked the track clinching Constructors' and Drivers' Championships like it was nothing. It was Constructors' title town, population, McLaren. Senna in particular was at times downright untouchable, taking the crown in 88, 90 and 91, and Prost kept the consistency game strong, adding to the team's glory with more Constructors' Championships. The McLaren-Honda combo was really something unlike the McLaren-Honda combo that came three decades later. But as all good things must come to an end, so did the McLaren-Honda partnership in 1992, leaving McLaren to explore other engine options. They tried Ford and Peugeot, but eventually McLaren found a long-lasting love in Mercedes, and it most certainly proved to be a fruitful partnership. They added further championships in 1998 and 1999, with Mika Hakkinen taking the driver's title in both years. The team was on a roll, and more success seemed imminent. Or so it seemed. You see, in 2000, a certain German in a certain red car arrived on the scene and swept every title from 2000 to 2004, while a certain Spaniard in a certain blue car would sweep the titles in the two years that followed. McLaren ran their competition close, but simply couldn't match the speed that Ferrari and Renault were bringing to the circuit. And in 2007, things went from bad to worse for the Papaya outfit when they were involved in a scandal over alleged spying on rivals Ferrari. They were slapped with a record fine of $100 million and were disqualified from the Constructors' Championship. To add to the heartbreak, both Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso narrowly missed out on the driver's title, losing both by just a single point in the last round to Kimi Raikkonen. Determined not to be a laughingstock, though, Mac McLaren bounced back with six race wins, eight pole positions and 13 podiums to claim the driver's title with Hamilton in 2008, in what was a triumphant moment for the team. In 2009, Ron Dennis called it quits as team principal, and Martin Whitmarsh took over the reins. The year didn't kick off too well for McLaren, though. Their MP4 24 car wasn't up to speed, and to make matters worse, they got slapped with a three-race suspended ban for falling the stewards during the Australian and Malaysian Grand Prix. But hey, they didn't stay down for too long. Towards the end of the season, Lewis showed up and snatched victories at the Hungarian and Singapore Grand Prix. Fast forward to the 2010s, and things were changing. McLaren lost their special status with Mercedes. Instead, McLaren became a customer and had a supply-customer relationship with Mercedes. Jensen Button joined forces with Hamilton in 2010, and they both had some success with a few wins, but they couldn't clinch any championships. The Red Bull Racing's RB6 was just too quick for their MP4 25. Next year, they kept the same driver lineup, and Hamilton bagged three wins while Button also had his fair share of victories. Button finished second behind Sebastian Vettel, who had dominated the season. In 2012, McLaren started strong with Button taking the win in Australia and Hamilton securing third. Hamilton later triumphed in Canada, but as the season went on, they hit some rough patches, with issues during pit stops and some reliability problems causing them valuable points. Red Bull and Seb would eventually clinch both titles, with former McLaren man Fernando Alonso giving the Austrian outfit a right run for their money. Seriously though, the 2012 season was the stuff of dreams, but it doesn't really make sense to be talking about it in this video. Luckily for you, I already have a video out on it, so make sure to go and 
and check it out. Subscribe while you're at it, will you? Then came 2013, and Hamilton decided to leave for Mercedes, so Sergio Perez took his spot. Despite the hype, though, the car, the MP428, didn't quite cut it against the top teams, and McLaren went without a podium finish for the first time in ages. Everything seemed to be going wrong for the team from Woking. In 2014, McLaren's association with Mercedes came to an end, and in the following year, they reunited with Honda for the first time since 1992, hoping for a return to former glory. However, it didn't go as planned. The 2015 season started disastrously, and the frustrations continued into 2016. Let's just say if Alonso and Jensen Button are struggling to make it out of Q1 in your car, your car is a monstrosity and should be incinerated immediately. At the end of 2016, an unexpected turn of events occurred when Ron Dennis, who had returned as CEO in 2014, was forced out of the team. Despite regime change in 2017, the results didn't significantly improve. Even the retirement of Button and the addition of Stoffer Vandon couldn't turn things around. The relationship with Honda turned sour, and a switch to Renault power units in 2018 didn't entirely resolve the team's problems. Both Alonso and Vandon eventually departed from the team, bidding farewell to Formula One. In 2019, McLaren brought in former Red Bull junior Carlos Sainz Jr. and 2018 Formula 2 runner-up Lando Norris as their new drivers. The addition of former Porsche endurance boss Andreas Seidel seemed to mark a period of steady recovery. The team's performance improved, with the cars constantly finishing points-paying positions. Sainz achieved a third-place finish for the team in Brazil in 2019, securing their first podium since Button's victory in the same race in 2012. The progress continued in 2020, with Norris and Sainz both securing podium finishes. McLaren finished third in the Constructors' Championship that year. However, by 2022, they had slipped up to fifth place in the Constructors' Championship, and Seidel departed to join Sauber in advance of the team's tie-up with Aldi. Andrea Stella was promoted to replace Seidel as the team continued to evolve. The 2023 season in particular held special significance for McLaren as they celebrated the 60th anniversary of the team's founding. In honor of this milestone, the season's car was even named the MCL 60 as a commemoration. However, the season did not start on a smooth note for McLaren. They encountered a myriad of issues prompting the team to release a public statement after the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. In response to the challenge, McLaren announced certain organizational changes, including the introduction of a Formula One technical executive team consisting of three specialized technical director roles. As part of these changes, technical director James Key parted ways with the company. However, the chaotic Australian Grand Prix proved to be a turning point, with both drivers finishing in the points. Norris claimed a sixth-place finish, while Piastri impressively secured his first points in Formula One and for McLaren by finishing in eighth. But really, it was the British Grand Prix, with both drivers benefiting from the new upgrades, that Norris and Piastri achieved McLaren's best qualifying result of the season so far, with Norris in second and Piastri in third on the grid. On race day, Norris had a quick start, overtaking Verstappen at the first corner and leading the race for the first four laps before being passed by Verstappen on lap five. Piastri maintained a strong third position and built a comfortable lead against Charles Leclerc. During the race, a virtual safety car and safety car were deployed after Kevin Magnussen's engine caught fire, benefiting Hamilton to jump ahead of Piastri into third after making his pit stop. Norris also took advantage of the safety car period, coming out ahead of Hamilton after his pit stop. Norris defended his position against Hamilton after the race resumed and finished in second place securing McLaren and Norris their first second-place finish since the 2021 Italian Grand Prix. Piastri finished in fourth place, battling against George Russell in his best Formula One career finish up to that point. The Hungarian Grand Prix brought further success for Norris, as he secured his first ever consecutive podium finish, finishing second. However, Piastri, despite starting in second place, slipped to fifth place by the end of the race. More recently at Spa, Norris and Piastri, in particular, showed some serious speed, qualifying in the shootout in fifth and second, respectively. The Papaya outfit felt strong during the sprint race, with Norris finishing sixth and Piastri snatching his first ever F1 podium, finishing second. On Sunday, the tables turned for McLaren. 
Piastri retired on the first lap after playing bumper cars with signs. I don't know what he was doing. I was there and just turned in like I didn't exist. While Norris achieved a respectable seventh place finish. The team has picked up a pretty sizable 86 points in the last four races, allowing them to close the gap on Ferrari. Point being, there has been a very noticeable uptick in McLaren's race pace and qualifying pace. When you add to that an exciting driver lineup capable of driving on the edge, you have a team that is not only building on its sense of direction, but can do so with the long run in mind. After years of failure and instability, it seems that McLaren have finally got their shop in order. Now, while we can't really make concrete predictions about how this season will go for them, since spanners like Spa can certainly be thrown into the mix, it certainly seems to be a resurgent trajectory. So, what do you make of McLaren's history? Tell you what, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out the one where I talked about the entire history of the sport. Yeah, that one was a blast to make. As always, thanks for watching.